morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's book launch event on Ethiopia's agri-food system, past trends, present challenges, and future scenarios. IFPRI's Paul Dorish and Bart Minton edited the book, which also has contributions from several other institutions from within and outside of Ethiopia. I'm Jenny Smart, Senior Research Analyst at IFPRI, and I will moderate today's session. Thank you for joining this virtual event live, and thank you to those who are also watching this event after, afterwards via the recording. Over the past two decades, agricultural sector performance in Ethiopia has seen substantial public investments, technical change, and output growth. The country has also experienced significant spatial and structural transformation. The urban population has tripled over 25 years, from 7.9 million in 1995 to 24.4 million in 2020, and agriculture's share of national employment and GDP has fallen. Furthermore, the country has seen dramatic improvements in household welfare, with rural poverty falling from 45% in the year 2000 to 24% in 2016, and the child stunting rate falling from 58 to 38% over these same years. Looking forward, how can Ethiopia sustain or even accelerate the progress that has been built in these last two, in these last two decades? We have an exciting program lined up for you today and we'll also be eager to hear from you. To participate in the Q&A session that will follow our three short book presentations and panel discussion, please submit your questions by typing them into the chat box on ifbree.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using hashtag AskIfBree on Twitter. We'd appreciate it if you'd also identify your name and affiliation and the person to whom you're directing your question. I'll now call on IFRI's Director General, Yo Swinnen, for opening remarks. Over to you, Yo. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, I am uh, extremely pleased to be here today to introduce uh, this book launch to you. Uh, it's been it's a very important element of our work in IFPRI that has uh, started uh, many years ago already and has coincided with the tremendous growth in the economy, in the Ethiopian economy and uh, improvement in poverty reduction and in welfare over there. Ethiopia has achieved remarkable success in increasing agricultural production, enhancing food security over the past three decades. This is due to a combination of factors, major investments, in agricultural technology and rural infrastructure, together with the liberalization of agricultural markets and the creation of well-targeted safety nets, the productive uh, safety net program, as you probably know. All of these have contributed to sustained economic growth and rising real incomes of the rural poor. IFPRI has a long history of policy relevant empirical research and analysis in Ethiopia. This started, for example, with the work on famines by Joachim von Braun and Patrick Webb in the 1990s, uh, the analysis of cereal markets by Eleni Gabri Madin in the 2000s, which led to the creation of the Ethiopian Commodity Exchange, and more recently, various IFPRI researchers affiliated with the Ethiopia Strategy Support Program have contributed surveys and analyses of safety net nutrition, poverty, development strategies, and a variety of topics to um, the public at large and the Ethiopian government specifically. This program, particularly in the last phase, was mostly funded by the EU, by DFID and by USAID, and we would certainly like to thank them for that support. The book that is launched today is titled Ethiopia's Agri-Food System, Past Trends, Current Challenges and Future, future Scenarios. This is a product coming out of IFPRI's country program work in Ethiopia over all these years. It synthesizes a large volume of research of transformation of agricultural production and markets that has taken place over the last decade, but it's all also deliberately forward-looking. It examines the major drivers of change, things like population growth, urbanization, income growth, resource constraint, climate change, etc. All of these factors have transformed and will continue to transform the Ethiopian agri-food system. It is certainly my hope that this book and IFPRI's ongoing research, policy analysis, and capacity strengthening efforts, together with, of course, our uh, international partners, but even more so our national partners, will contribute to a steady and sustainable increase in welfare of Ethiopia's people. I very much look forward to hearing from uh, the various uh, contributors to the book, but also to the discussions on the panel today, their views, on how uh, this can contribute to indeed sustainable increase in welfare of Ethiopia's uh, people in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yo. 
We will now move to the book presentation portion of our program and first hear from Bart Minton. Bart is a senior research fellow in the Development Strategy and Governance Division of IFPRI and was the program leader of the Ethiopian Strategy Support Program in Addis Ababa from 2011 to 2020. Over to you, Bart. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, depending where you are. So uh, we have uh, three presentations lined up for you, uh, and I'm going to present a little bit the stylized facts that we have found on the transformation of the agro-food system uh, related to production markets and consumption. Uh, next slide, please. So we are going to look first at what has been happening with agricultural production. We have seen in this case a rapid growth. Uh, the graph on your screens show the growth that we have seen in the grain sector, uh, the biggest sector in Ethiopia. We have split up that growth by yield growth and by area growth, and we see uh, significant numbers for both of them. Um, what we see happens, from, for example, at the beginning of the decade, combined yield and area growth was, was uh, led to a 10% uh, animal growth. However, we see over time that these trends are going down, uh, especially the area expansion is really declining rapidly. It was 4% in 2005, 2006, and then we go to uh, 2017, 18, it basically had come to uh, zero. So we see, we have seen rapid growth, but we see also that that growth and the, the, is declining. Next slide, please. Part of that growth has been due to intensification. So there has been a rapid increase in the adoption of uh, improved seeds and rapid increase in chemical fertilizer use. Uh, on this graph, we see how that fertilizer use has changed over the last decade. In uh, 2008, uh, basically, uh, Ethiopian farmers were using zero 0.4 million, million tons of fertilizer. We go to 10 years later, 2017, 2018, and that fertilizer use has tripled to 1.2 million tons. So uh, a massive increase in the use of fertilizer contributing to that production growth. Next slide, please. We see also quite some changes happening in agricultural markets, especially we see an improvement in market access. The map on the left of Ethiopia shows the situation of road infrastructure in 2007. Everything that is dark shows the remoteness of uh, or the closeness of rural villages to uh, cities of, uh, of at least 50,000 people. That's the situation in 2007. Then we move to 10 years later in, uh, in 2016. A lot of investments have happened in road infrastructure. Uh, cities have been growing and we see that a lot of this urban population is better connected to cities. This is very important. Uh, we see, and that is shown in the graph below, if farmers are better connected to markets, they have incentives to be more productive. The graph below shows how, for example, the TEF yield is changing depending on where these farmers are located with respect to cities. The villages that were located close to Addis Ababa, they were able to achieve a yield that was 50% higher than those farmers that were far out. So this improved connectivity is obviously leading to big transformation. Next slide. We see that also having an effect on the functioning of agricultural markets. And we see marketing margins that are significantly smaller now than they were before. This graph shows the difference of market prices between uh, the maize surplus area of Mekent and uh, the biggest city in the country, Addis Ababa, and uh, maize uh, deficit area, uh, Mekele. So if we look at the situation in 2001, the difference of the price of Mekent with Addis was about 100 per, per quintal. We see how that difference is changing over time. And we see in 2017, basically, that the, that the, the cost of uh, bringing maize to Addis had declined to one third. 
in the case of Michele, it started off at 200 ampere and it declined to one fourth for an indication of the improve, improved road connectivity, but also of the increased uh, uh, competition in these markets. Next slide. Ethiopia is also becoming much more integrated into the international uh, trade scene. Uh, this shows how much Ethiopia was importing and exporting over the last uh, 15 years. So in 2000, 2001, they were basically importing, or 2001, 2002, they were basically importing for half a billion dollars. This is the line at the bottom. And so these imports have been significantly uh, going up over time. This reflects partly the increasing imports of chemical fertilizer, but also the imports of food such as rice and wheat. If you look at the top, we see that what's happening with exports, agricultural exports. So uh, Ethiopia was exporting in 2001, 2002, about half a billion dollars. In, uh, in 2015, 16, this had increased to two and a half billion dollars, driven by increasing export of coffee, sesame, flowers, etc. If we uh, look if we compare these exports with these imports, we see that Ethiopia actually has been a net agricultural exporter in most of these uh, years. Next slide. On the food consumption side, we see increasing diet diversity, as you would expect in a transforming economy. On the left, we see the share of cereals in the food basket of urban of uh, consumers in Ethiopia. In 2000, about 50% of the budget of a consumer would go towards cereals. In 2016, the last national household survey, we see that that share of cereals had come down to uh, 30%. On the right hand, we see what has happened with these other expenditures. So we see more. Uh, expenditures on animal sourced foods, on oils and fats, and on uh, fruits and vegetables. Next slide. One of the problems is that uh, for these increased, exp increased expenses on uh, fruits and vegetables and animal sourced foods is that these prices have been going up much more significantly than for other crops. You see in this graph how these prices have changed for these different food group. For grain, roots, and tubers, we see over the period 2005 to 2018 that these real prices for that group hasn't changed a lot. While the prices for these foods that are really good for, your, for nutrition, they have increased much uh, uh, faster. On the other hand, we see that these prices for sugar and honey, oils and fat have actually been declining in real terms. So these messages are actually a big concern for people interested in nutrition. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. We will now hear from Alamayu Sayem Tafese, IFPRI Senior Research Fellow and current program leader of the Ethiopia Strategy Support Program. Over to you, Alamayu. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, happy uh, Ethiopian New Year to, to you all. Uh, I'll, as announced, I'll talk to you about uh, poverty and safety nets, particularly focusing on the nature impact and challenge of uh, the productive safety net program, which as you all pointed out in the introduction, the major ingredient in the improvement of welfare uh, uh, during the, uh, the period. Uh, the key uh, observation or premise for the uh, Productive Safety Net Program is the uh, uh, existence and exposure of shocks that uh, uh, are experienced by uh, Ethiopians. Next slide, please, sorry. Uh, experienced by uh, uh, Ethiopians uh, regularly. Uh, these shocks include droughts, uh, flooding, pests, human and animal uh, uh, diseases and economic uh, economic shocks. Some of these are uh, one-off, others are recurrent. Uh, some are uh, local, others are uh, more widespread. Drought perhaps is the most common and uh, recurrent one. And as everybody recalls, uh, we have a, a major uh, drought affecting millions of households in 2015-16, and that is the most recent major, major uh, drought. 
these shocks obviously are consequential, particularly in terms of uh, the onset and uh, continuity of uh, uh, poverty through their uh, short-term as well as long-term uh, effects. Uh, a good example in this regard is drought. Uh, it is uh, reported by a significant fraction of households that loss of income and reduced consumption uh, were, were experienced by them due to such uh, droughts. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, exposure to droughts and famine while young could lead to uh, 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 negative uh, uh, anthropometric outcomes, such as uh, short uh, shortness relative to relative to uh, the norm uh, while uh, adults. Next slide, please. So, uh, in terms of uh, uh, policy, therefore, uh, these mitigating these uh, shocks were uh, at the center. And uh, the productive safety net program is the latest and perhaps more systematic uh, response uh, uh, to uh, drought shocks. Uh, the PSNP has uh, 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 first a rural uh, variant, which has been uh, ongoing since 20, uh, uh, to, to 2005, while an urban variant was introduced uh, uh, very recently. I'll focus on the, the rural uh, PSNP. Uh, the program has uh, uh, the following uh, features. First, it is targeted at smoothing consumption or protecting assets in times of crisis uh, through transfers offered uh, and the form of participation in the public, public works program for those who are able-bodied or direct support, the form of direct support, unconditional support for those uh, who could not. And all these programs are uh, introduced in chronically food insecure communities. So there is significant targeting both at the community and at the household uh, level. The public works program uh, build community assets intended to enhance uh, productivity in the community, such as soil and water conservation structures, including irrigation, roads, schools, and uh, clinics. Another major feature of the PSNP is its size. It's multi-year and involves the participation of multiple donors uh, thereby demanding and uh, 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 demanding coordination between the government, it, it, the government of Ethiopia, sorry, and uh, donors. It's large, uh, covering about eight million beneficiaries on average, and a budget of about half a billion uh, per year on average. One uh, important feature of the PSNP as a program is its uh, uh, independent col and collaborative monitoring that has. Uh, uh, introduced uh, by design from uh, the beginning. Next slide, please. So uh, this large program has uh, been evaluated over the years and it has uh, 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 scored significant uh, 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 goals. Uh, the first in line with its basic feature is uh, food security. Uh, over the years, the Productive Safety Net Program we're able to improve the food gap, the number of months that uh, uh, households were uh, able, unable to fill uh, their uh, food needs uh, by 0.2 months for every 100 per uh, transferred. And this is particularly true in uh, the highlands. If you'd like, uh, given the, the average transfer real terms was about 500 uh, per, per household uh, per year, this leads to about a month a month's uh, uh, worth of improvement in the food gap or reduction in the food gap. It also enabled households to access more food and better food in the, as measured by improvements in uh, diet, uh, dietary diversity at the household level. In addition, uh, it was able to uh, enhance resilience and uh, produce economy-wide effects. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, we look at in the next slide uh, a chart which uh, uh, which shows the recovery trajectory of uh, two types of households. The orange dashed line are PSNP beneficiaries, while the blue dashed line represents the trajectory of uh, non PSNP households. Both these households were exposed to the same drought shock, and we see two differences represented by this. First the PSNP households did not suffer as much 
as the non-PSNP households at the time or due to uh, the shock, you could clearly see uh, the, the gap in, in, uh, in these, in these uh, uh, two benefits. So uh, they, uh, PSNP enabled reduction in vulnerability. It also enabled beneficiaries achieve uh, uh, return to their original pre-shock level of welfare uh, in shorter period of time, about two years rather than rather than four. So uh, the recovery trajectory uh, the, uh, and the resilience of these households will improve. An additional benefit the PSNP has is to the locality within which it is uh, uh, implemented. So far, we have focused on the impact uh, on direct beneficiaries alone. The local economy uh, uh, has also benefited due to the uh, PSNP transfers because of income multipliers generated through markets. And this range from uh, one to uh, 2.4 uh, Ethiopian birth for every birth transferred. Uh, uh, and the size of this multiplier depends on uh, how market developed uh, a company is. Next slide, please. So uh, the, this, these were uh, the benefits, uh, brief uh, benefits of the uh, productive safety net program. Of course, there are uh, uh, important challenges as any program would have. The first is the fact that uh, these benefits were not achieved at the child level. Child nutritional outcomes were not uh, significantly affected by the PSNP and uh, the uh, uh, diet quality of children remain poor. Also, uh, livelihood and asset creation uh, objectives uh, were not uh, fully achieved, uh, particularly programs such as the other food security programs or household asset building programs associated with the PSNP were not as successful in improving livelihoods or building assets as they were uh, planned. Third, uh, targeting was overall good. Geographic and community targeting was uh, uh, successful in uh, the highlands. However, it proved problematic in the lowlands with uh, uh, consequent consequences to uh, the program's uh, uh, successes. Graduation was not uh, uh, successful as initially aspired to and it is a less understood uh, process. And this is true, of course, uh, most all over uh, the world. The current version of the Productive Safety Net Program or phase of that program, PSNP4, is trying to correct uh, some of these weaknesses by introducing nutrition sensitive interventions, livelihood components and livelihood transfer scale up and other you know, innovations such as uh, temporary direct support and uh, social workers. One important observation at the end of this all, uh, is that although the PSNP is successful in many ways, uh, uh, considerable food insecurity and vulnerability remains in Ethiopia. And this has been shown by uh, the current uh, crisis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, COVID-19. COVID, uh, uh, in in uh, the scheme of things, the incidence uh, of the illness is uh, uh, is uh, uh, not as large. And what is important is that its impacts on incomes were able to be uh, partially mitigated by PSNP transfers in both urban and rural areas. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Alamayu. And as a reminder to those that may be just joining us to participate in our Q&A session that will follow these presentations of the book and the following panel discussion, we ask that you please submit your questions on ifpri.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or on Twitter by using hashtag askifpri. When submitting your question, please remember also to identify yourself and the person to whom you're going to direct your question. We'll now hear from Paul Dorish. Paul is the Director of the Development, Strategy, and Governance Division of IFPRI and was the Program Leader of the Ethiopia Strategy Support Program from 2008 to 2010. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Jenny. As Barton Alamayu have described, Ethiopia has achieved considerable agricultural growth and poverty reduction over the past 10 to 20 years. A key question that we address in the book is, can future agricultural growth effectively promote poverty reduction given structural change in Ethiopia's economy? Next slide, please. 
three key factors will help determine the answer to this question. One, the growth of agricultural supply relative to demand. And that will depend, uh, that will influence whether prices go up or down with great effect on uh, food deficit households. Second, uh, structural change in the economy. How fast uh, farmers move from agriculture into the non-farm economy. Third, the changing structure of demand that Bart described earlier and how the share of ag the agricultural food, uh, agri-food products uh, increases uh, over time. Next slide, please. Another key uh, factor that will determine uh, Ethiopia's growth path is the availability of foreign exchange. This figure shows key components of Ethiopia's balance of payments over time. And the various sources of foreign exchange are represented by the shaded areas. The height of the total shaded area represents the total value of imports. As indicated, the total value of imports has risen sharply over time from about four million dollars, uh, four billion dollars in 2004-05 to about 16 billion dollars in 2019-20. What has financed these imports? Well, exports, the bottom uh, uh, pattern shown in blue, have, have only accounted for about 20% of foreign exchange earnings over the last five years. Instead, more than 70% of foreign exchange revenues came from remittances and private transfers. That's shown in green, the foreign direct investment, the blue and white stripes, and the foreign capital inflows in red. And these latter three sources will likely not grow as fast in the future. Next slide, please. A second important constraint is land. The map on the left, based on satellite data on land cover, shows that the eastern side of the Ethiopian highland, highlands, shown in yellow and green, is the most intensively cultivated part of Ethiopia. In the book, we present analysis by Emily Schmidt and Tim Thomas that includes a regression explaining the share of land devoted to crops as a function of elevation, rainfall, access to markets, and other factors. We then use parameters from that regression to estimate potential share of land cultivated. And the map on the right shows the results in terms of potential area expansion. And there in that map, the pink and brown areas of the Eastern Highlands show regions where there is little scope for further increases in area cultivated. The main conclusion is that there is little potential for cropland expansion in the Highlands Though in the lowlands, uh, area cultivated could potentially expand to cover about a third of that area. Next slide. To simulate the future growth path of Ethiopia's economy, we use a computable general equilibrium model. And here in these simulations, uh, we assume that land grows very slowly because as Bart had pointed out and as the uh, last slide had shown, uh, there's not much scope for increasing area cultivated in the highlands. Uh, second, we, we assume uh, in, uh, continued uh, rapid urbanization. And third, we assume that, the cap that we have foreign exchange constraints that will limit the financing of investment uh, going forward. And finally, we have uh, technical change and we assume it continues, but perhaps not as fast as it has been in the past in the agricultural sector. Next slide, please. We also analyze three different public investment strategies in which higher shares of public investment are devoted either to agriculture, the rural non-farm sector or to urban infrastructure. These simulations show that agricultural growth is likely to decelerate uh, in the coming decades because of the growing land constraints and because urbanization will slow the growth in the rural labor force. 
Nonetheless, with rapid growth in the non-agricultural economy, demand for agricultural products will continue to rise. And that makes increasing agricultural production very important to prevent an increase in real food prices that would harm the poor. We also see in the simulations that the share of downstream activities in the broader agri-food system is likely to continue to grow over time. In other words, those trends that we were seeing uh, in Bart's presentation are likely to continue. Next slide, please. We also analyzed three different public investment strategies in which higher shares of public investment are devoted to either agriculture, the rural non-farm sector, or urban infrastructure. And these model simulations indicate that urban investments do indeed generate faster economic growth and structural transformation. However, in spite of rapid urbanization and structural transformation, the bulk of Ethiopia's poor will likely still be living in rural areas in the coming decades, and their livelihoods will be dependent on agriculture and the rural non-farm economy. And as a result, investments in agriculture and the rural non-farm sector will likely remain the most effective at reducing poverty, at least through the mid 2020s. Next slide, please. So these results are illustrated in this figure that shows how much faster or slower is consumption growth for the poor under alternative public investment strategies. So in our baseline simulation, per capita consumption of the poor grows by an average of 3.3%. But if you put a little bit more investment in agriculture, holding total investment con constant, these increase in investments in agriculture or in the rural non-farm sector raise per capita consumption growth of the poor by about 0.5 percentage points. In other words, from 3.3, up to 4%. By contrast, with increased investment in urban sectors, growth in per capita consumption of the poor, who remember are concentrated in rural areas, is reduced by about 0.3 percentage points. Next slide. By about 2025, with the changing structure of the economy, investments in agriculture are no longer the most pro poor. Instead, investments in the rural non farm economy are the most pro-poor. Uh, and but ultimately, by the late 2020s, as rural urban migration continues and the share of agriculture in the economy falls, investments in urban infrastructure become most effective at raising incomes of the poor. But the bottom line is that at present, investments in agriculture and the rural non-farm economy are the most pro-poor public investments. And this will continue likely continue through the mid 2020s. Next slide, please. So what are the implications for other countries in Africa? Although agroecologies may differ, we argue that the basic ingredients for Ethiopia's success are applicable more widely. These key policies and ingredients were a sustained commitment to the agricultural sector through public investments in agricultural research, extension, roads, and ensuring wide access to fertilizer and improved seeds. Second, avoidance of market distortions, such as imposition of official market prices and large scale imports, which have taxed producers in many other African countries. Third, safety nets that effectively target food insecure households. And finally, policies and programs to promote macroeconomic and political stability. Next slide. Thank you, and Amasa Ganalo. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. We will now move to the panel discussion portion of our program. We're pleased to have here with us a very distinguished panel of guests. I will ask each panelist to respond to the same question in the first round, and we'll start with Dr. Luli Mitik Bayeni, CEO of the Ethiopian Economics Association. Dr. Luli, what were the priorities for the agricultural development and poverty alleviation in Ethiopia before COVID-19 and how have these changed? Over to you, Dr. Luli. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to start by saying that I found uh, the book uh, 
very interesting and complete and gives a, it has really uh, a lot of information and it's been assembled in one document. So we are really grateful to, to the authors for availing uh, such a resource. Uh, on the priorities for agricultural development and poverty elevation in Ethiopia before COVID-19, uh, a number of policies have been designed and implemented. And if we start from the ADLI policy to the GTPs, uh, agricultural development and poverty reduction have been, uh, have been at the center of, of, the, of the agenda. Uh, transformation is a notion that comes back. It's also, it also comes back um, uh, today. And looking at the priorities, uh, production and productivity were uh, main targets. Uh, food self-sufficiency and export revenue generations, these are um, uh, objectives we, we regularly find when we go through the different documents. And of course, to attain these objectives, there has been substantial public investments in rural roads, uh, in terms of power, input supply, fertilizers, uh, improved seeds, extension services. Uh, rural finance has also uh, been part of the, uh, of, the, of the public interventions. And in parallel to this, also a lot of pro-poor spendings to increase access to basic services, but also programs like the PSNP. So overall, the picture uh, is, is essentially led by, uh, by government interventions or government public investments. Uh, now, if I go back to, to, the, to the second part of, 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 of the question, uh, we could reframe it uh, in, in such a way that we could ask, is there an after COVID-19? And uh, I think uh, the COVID-19 also coincides with uh, important reforms and changes in our country. Uh, now, whether it is because of the COVID or not, uh, it's, not uh, it's not obvious yet, but uh, notions like national and global value chains have uh, have become very important and have been recognized. Uh, the role of the private sector is being put forward in terms of agricultural uh, investments in the agriculture sector. Uh, affordability has also become an important issue. How can the agricultural sector, but also across the value chain, uh, how can food become affordable, but also nutritious food? Uh, so those are also notions that are coming back, uh, and also off-farm employment. Uh, so this is, I, I would say these are uh, the, the, I think the changes uh, that, are, that are coming. And finally, modernization and mechanization, and maybe slowly a shift away from labor-intensive production towards uh, more capital-intensive approaches. So that's, that's what we get now. Great, right, thank you so much, Dr. Luli. Um, we'll now turn to Dr. Namera Gabeyu Mamo, uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Planning and Development Commission of Ethiopia. Dr. Namera, I'll ask you the same question. What were the priorities for agricultural development and poverty alleviation in Ethiopia before COVID-19 and how have these changed? Over to you, Dr. Namera. Oh, and Dr. Namera, I think you're muted still. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us to, to take a part on this uh, uh, fruitful discussion on uh, Ethiopia's uh, agricultural sector development in general and the agri-food system in particular. And, uh, and I have to really give a good uh, no, uh, appreciation about the preparedness that went into producing this book. I just read the four-pager uh, synopsis and. Uh, it looks, it covers uh, wide, broad, you know, issues concerning Ethiopian uh, agricultural uh, sector. And uh, I look forward to really get the book and uh, read. And also perhaps, you know, arrange with the uh, IFPRI and uh, Planning and Development Commission to really, you know, uh, have a further discussion together or workshop together so that uh, we really use some of the input and some of the issues raised in this in our uh, planning and uh, development uh, processes. 
So coming back to the question, to be honest, uh, when it comes to the priority, uh, the priority hasn't changed it. Uh, if anything, uh, a COVID situation has uh, necessitated the importance of uh, substantial agricultural growth uh, for Ethiopia's aspirations uh, uh, to sustain the broad-based growth that have been achieved over the past uh, uh, two, 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 three decades. Uh, uh, the focus has always been, uh, you know, uh, improving food production and productivity, so that we uh, uh, we you know achieve uh, food security and uh, poverty alleviation through which we can uh, bring. Uh, welfare uh, improvements both at the rural and uh, 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 urban level. So, of course, the government have uh, managed to identify several, you know, mechanisms through which how to really expand the, the production and the productivity in the agriculture sector when it comes to large-scale commercialization, uh, market orientation for the smallholder farming uh, 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 have been the focus area for, you know, the agricultural policies and the strategies that Ethiopia had tried to you know, uh, uh, pursue in the past. Of course, in terms of priorities, this will always remain to be a priority because uh, for Ethiopia to achieve structural economic transformation and bring uh, prosperity to the country, agricultural sector remains to be the backbone uh, in terms of uh, the potential for output growth and also the uh, uh, job creation potential that uh, it uh, uh, entails. But of course, comes with this is the mixed re uh, results that uh, we achieved as, uh, as, uh, as a country in the past. Of course, massive interventions by the government have, uh, have you know, significantly improved uh, the market access uh, point is that earlier uh, Bart was uh, uh, mentioning. Through that, of course, the overall rural poverty have been you know, significantly reduced uh, in Ethiopia co compared to other uh, developing countries. Uh, only in uh, uh, in a, in a two-decade matter, Ethiopia have uh, you know almost reduced by half the ratio of the people who live under uh, poverty line from about 49, uh, 45 percent in uh, 2000 to about 20, 22 percent uh, uh, recently or uh, in the current day. But there are also mixed stories in terms of you know the structural economic transformations because we want. Uh, higher, higher, you know, grows in uh, the agriculture. Hence, uh, we bring these, uh, you know, modern sectors or urban sectors would, uh, you know, uh, bring the desired modernity or productivity that uh, Ethiopia aspires to achieve. But when it comes to the share of output, of course, agriculture is de declining in relation to other uh, sectors. Only in uh, 10 years alone, the share of the output from the agriculture declined from 47% uh, to now about 32%. But when you see the sectoral labor share of the agriculture, it still you know, takes uh, the biggest chunk of our uh, total labor force, uh, which actually accounts to about you know, seven, more than 70% uh, based on recent survey, I think uh, five, six years ago, the, the survey that have been done, uh, the overall labor you know, uh, uh, distributions across uh, uh, sectors. The same thing with the sectoral export share. Uh, the agriculture is still the dominant share of Ethiopia's, you know, export uh, earning. So these are really a mixed, you know, results that uh, we've achieved as a country. So there is a lot to, you know, do in this sector. In terms of the priorities, you know, uh, keeping or sustaining, accelerating the agricultural growth that achieved over the past two, three decades is fundamental. But accelerating it is, uh, is uh, the most uh, vital and uh, Government has tried to identify you know, uh, challenges that have been faced over the past. Uh, one is actually mentioned earlier, the issue of land availability, which can be the population pressure, uh, the yeah. shocks. Still, Ethiopia is uh, vulnerable to shocks, man-made and uh, you know, nature, uh, climate change, you know, drought, uh, which leads to water scarcity. And also recently we faced this uh, desert locust invasion. So these are you know, the, the, the shocks that makes Ethiopian agriculture Overall, Ethiopian economy, you know, more vulnerable. And also in terms of the public investment, did Ethiopia make enough investment in the agricultural sector? Of course, in the broader sense, uh, the public, the government has invested a lot. But when it comes to the agricultural sector, we need to closely look, given the potential and the scale of uh, the, the challenges that we face in the agriculture sector, has the government really invested enough? Where the policy complementarities were, you know, suitable to the priorities, uh, uh, identified. So these are the areas that needs to be prioritized and uh, uh, 
uh, uh, being focused, but in terms of, you know, the priorities, uh, really, I mean, we're still living in the COVID era and COVID has not significantly affected the Ethiopian agriculture sector. So I would say the priorities remain the same, but uh, yeah, the Thank type you. of policies and strategies we should be following uh, should, should show some, uh, you know, changes. So, yeah. Thank Over you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Namir. And we'll come back to you again in, in the second round of, of questions. We'd like to now move over to hear from Dr. Dominique Dabu, who is the head of rural development, green sector and food security of the delegation of the European Union to Ethiopia. Dr. Dabu, can you tell us what were the priorities for agricultural development and poverty alleviation in Ethiopia before COVID-19 and how have these changed from your perspective? Yes. Okay, first of all, uh, good afternoon and thank you for inviting me uh, to this presentation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I will not contradict the two person before saying that indeed, yes, development of agricultural production and productivity as the key priority which has been uh, driving the, 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 the agriculture. Uh, re with lately reduction of terrain uh, dependency with the irrigation program, the mechanization of course, coming into place and a better link between research and extension services. And somehow, I think we start now to speak also in the, in the context of climate change of uh, more sustainable agriculture practices. Now, in the last reform also, we have looked at uh, new priority emerging. And uh, recently we speak a lot of uh, as priorities in terms of reduction of food import and uh, basically uh, import substitution in the agriculture sector. Of course, that target the large import of wheat, which is li uh, largely linked to food aid, but is also to look also at the emerging uh, urban market with uh, oil, sugar, for example, and also the processed product to in reduction of processed product. The second key, I would say, new emerging priority that we see is development of specific uh, value chain for strategic reason. Although one that we can mention, of course, is the development of the livestock in association with the development of the pastoralist area and the non -pastor in the, for the pastoralist and the non-pastoralist communities living in arid and semi-arid areas. Uh, there are also strategic commodities. We spoke in the past of sugar, uh, of course, that has been having some issues, but of course, sugar will remain uh, one strategic commodities. Uh, we might have some coming up in the future, like cotton. There was some initiative on cotton, but not yet finalized. The third new priority that we saw uh, coming uh, on government side is really a better integration between commercial agriculture and agro-industrialization with a strong link with the government uh, strategy on job creation and also driven by the agenda on, on agro-industrial park. That is something extremely important because we are the opening of the page with to, to private sector investment, the link with PPP, uh, public private sector uh, approach, but also re really to, to, to give the, uh, some of the share on, in terms of agriculture development to the agri sector. In the context of COVID, uh, we think that those priorities have not been changed, uh, basically. Instead, what we have, the COVID has uh, underlined a number of vulnerabilities, but also a number of strengths of the agriculture sector. So in terms of vulnerabilities, what we could uh, mention is that uh, the, the precarious situation of the farm factory informal labor workers uh, they have been in precarious situation and they were the first to be laid off when the market is contracted. And that was particularly uh, obvious for the cut floor and the uh, horticulture uh, market. The second was uh, that we have, what was been on the line is that because of contraction of forex revenue, the dependency of food import is becoming more and more difficult to sustain and then, of course, we saw a response from government to try to, to, to develop this substitution to food import by reconverting some of the uh, uh, disused irrigated area from sugar production, for example, to wheat or to other commodities. The third constraint that we saw during the COVID crisis was the ability of the public service to, 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 to deliver to the farmers. 
Sud uh, public service was not available to the, for direct contact for the farmers, and that means that the way of working, the way to the, to the provide extension services as per the old model is not functioning, and something has to be done. And let's mention also here the difficulty between also to uh, translate that in the different regions and to have a coherent approach to that. On the contrary, the COVID-19 has revealed some resilience of the agri sector. And we saw that in three major areas. The first thing is that more than any sector, the, the agriculture sector has enabled to maintain the export revenue of the government. Without the coffee export, without any, without the horticulture export, uh, the, the, the government will have an, a really a, a huge issue of debt sustainab sustainability. So it reinforces the role in the stability of the macroeconomic of the agriculture sector. The second, what was quite important, is the ability to supply the market, the domestic market. Uh, we have been monitoring in this delegation price on the market on a weekly basis, and we have not seen a major inflation aspect uh, effect due to the COVID. We saw inflation, a flare of inflation due to the, uh, the due to security issues, but not to the COVID. The third point is the the social aspect. Uh, we have not seen uh, the, despite COVID. People, uh, rural people have been uh, able to maintain their livelihood and therefore we have not seen a huge move in terms of rural migration. So let's look at the COVID as an opportunity and let's, uh, let's look at the COVID razor as a way to refocus uh, some already some very good policy which are dominant in the, in the agri sector and let's take lesson from that. Uh, that's all from me, over. Thank you, Mr. Dabu. And I'll just remind uh, our presenters to continue to keep their, their comments concise as we're running a little bit short on time. We wanna make sure we get to our Q&A. Um, and we're not gonna to turn to our last panelist. Uh, this is Professor John Hodnott, H.E. Babcock Professor of Food and Nutrition Economics and Policy in the Division of Nutritional Sciences at the Cornell Institute for Public Affairs. Professor Hodnott, what were the priorities for agricultural development um, and poverty alleviation in Ethiopia before COVID-19 and how have these changed? Over to you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, hello to everyone listening in either now or to the recording later. And my congratulations to the editors and authors of this fine and thought-provoking book. Jenny, you ask what were the priorities for agricultural development and poverty alleviation in Ethiopia before COVID-19? And I think much of that has been covered by our previous speakers. In terms of agricultural development, there is an emphasis on increasing production, particularly within that increasing productivity, given the, given the rapidly closing land frontier, but also doing so in an, in, in an inclusive fashion, making sure that agricultural development is spread across the country and not just in high potential areas. That strategy towards agricultural development was in itself key towards strategies for reducing poverty. Uh, poverty, the allevi alleviation strategy in itself was complemented as Dr. Alamayo has described by the implementation of a safety net, the PSMP, uh, designed to assist in particular food insecure households living in the food insecure parts of rural Ethiopia. Well, COVID-19 does not change the broad priorities, but it does create opportunities to accelerate new strategies to ensure their continued success. And it suggests some reorientation within some of these broad areas. And what I'd like to do is to highlight three. One is the importance of increasing output and productivity in the non-staple agricultural sector. As a number of speakers have noted, while stable food prices uh, have remained relatively contained in part because of the impressive increases in output, that has not been the case for non-staple foods. Increasing productivity in this area offers a win in three different areas. Where it makes sense both agroecologically and economically for farmers to enter or expand production in these areas, it allows them to move into higher value activities, thus boosting their rural incomes, 
where those are products which are produced for export that assists in meeting Ethiopia's foreign exchange requirements, and to the extent to which this dampens or actually reduces the relative cost of these foods relative to other items, it makes them more affordable for both uh, households in rural and in urban areas. Second, as Dr. Bart has noted, an important part of the Ethiopia story over the last 15 years has been the dramatic improvement in physical infrastructure, roads, bridges, and the like, which have played an important role in uh, connecting farmers to markets. That needs to stay in place, that, can, that emphasis, as does emphasis on information communication technologies. Those technologies played an important role in informing households in both urban and rural areas about the COVID-19 outbreak. They can play a role in connecting farmers to markets to allow workers in urban areas to find out about new job opportunities and so on and so forth. And finally, as Dr. Paul has described, Whereas in the past, historically, Ethiopia's poverty efforts have focused on rural areas, Ethiopia is now a rapidly urbanizing country, as anyone who's been to Addis, to Jimma, to Mekele, or elsewhere can attest. Uh, now is the time to begin to think much more seriously about urban poverty alleviation programs. And this is where I think COVID-19 may have actually played a particularly important role. Past, past shocks, climatic economic, as Dr. Alamayo has pointed out, have focused primarily on rural areas. Arguably COVID is the first shock, which has had impacts, direct impacts, both in urban and rural areas. And that reinforces the importance of an urban poverty alleviation strategy moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, John, uh, Dr. Havnat. Um, and thank you to everybody for all these wonderful comments uh, in, the, in the first round. This is just a reminder to our audience that we're looking forward to also hearing uh, questions from you. To participate in our Q&A session with all of our speakers today that will follow this uh, next round of panel discussion, please submit your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using hashtag askifpre on Twitter. And again, when doing so, please identify yourself and the person to whom you're directing your question. I'll now turn to each of our panelists with the second round of each uh, one question, but I'll just remind the, the presenters to please keep your responses if possible to only two minutes. Um, I apologize, but in the interest of time, we'll try to move uh, right, right along after this to our Q&A portion. So turning back to Dr. Namera, this question is for you. How has the COVID-19 crisis affected the macro growth targets of the overall 10-year plan and the implementation of the three-year homegrown economic reform program? Over to you, Dr. McNamara. Uh, thank you once again. Yeah, uh, so I mean, as uh, I said earlier, we are uh, still during the COVID era. And uh, when it comes to the actual assessment of the COVID impact on the wider economic uh, you know, uh, sectors, is uh, still undergoing. So, you know, there is no fundamental changes to uh, the targets that have been set uh, already in the 10 years perspective plan. But uh, to be honest with you, we don't know where, uh, you know, how, how long this uh, crisis would stay with us and uh, how long this uh, would really affect, you know, in a real terms, the Ethiopian economy. Uh, because if you really see some of the indicators in the uh, the last, you know, Ethiopian fiscal year, which was the 2012, uh, that uh, closed in June. If you see the export performance of the agricultural sector, uh, it has incredibly shown, uh, you know, uh, big, big growth, uh, even though COVID has affected, you know, almost the second half of uh, uh, the, the fiscal year. Uh, the, and, uh, and also we're doing this, uh, the, the actual annual GDP, you know, uh, calculations. Not the same thing with the sectoral, you know, uh, grosses, you know. So if there would be any actual, you know, changes to it, of course, uh, we would have to really look closely into our uh, uh, macro, you know, models and uh, growth projections. And also, you know, uh, look into some of certain assumptions that uh, we put in place because some of these assumptions were uh, set in uh, before the outbreak of uh, 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 COVID. But... To be honest, as uh, uh, as it stands now, there is no uh, you know 
changes to the overall growth target. Uh, we're still, you know, uh, seeing, uh, seeing that uh, the the sectoral output share of uh, agriculture uh, that we set, uh, which is standing 32 percent today, uh, would fall to 22 percent in 10 years down the line uh, by 2030. Uh, we still think uh, the poverty elevation, the total poverty elevation, the rural and urban from its current 20, 22 uh, percent uh, would fall to 7 percent in 10 years down the line. These are the growth, you know, uh, target uh, uh, we set, and uh, there is no really big uh, fundamental changes. But of course, there must be uh, some, you know, uh, checking of the assumptions and also the identification of priority focus areas. Because if you see, for example, uh, we said that Ethiopia has to diversify its uh, source of growth, uh, tourism being uh, one of uh, the areas that have been promoted uh, a lot. But of course, uh, if you see from global you know, uh, perspective and also uh, from an African perspective, uh, one of the most severely hit sector was uh, the service sector uh, from which tourism were uh, one of uh, 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 the sectors. So such a kind of uh, uh, reprioritization and re-emphasizing the priorities of the sectors uh, would really you know, happen. But uh, uh, to be frank with you, uh, we haven't yet you know, started that because we need to do first how the COVID has really affected the overall you know, uh, actual growth. In terms of the implementations of uh, homegrown economic reforms, uh, to be honest, COVID brought an opportunity for Ethiopia because Ethiopia has already started you know, broad-based domestic reforms. So what COVID has, uh, 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 did was actually open the, the eyes of uh, policymakers wide open so that they really make all the reform processes, you know, shock resilient, you know, shock such as uh, these, you know, health issues uh, which entailed uh, socioeconomic, you know, uh, 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 risks. So I would, I, would, I would really say that the COVID bro uh, brought an opportunity to fast track the domestic, you know, uh, areas. For example, in the financial sector, what the government is doing is incredible in terms of digitizing all the financial services and also supporting the commercial banks, which were, you know, part of the macroeconomic reforms. The same thing with the fiscal policies, where the government has to, you know, really follow this tight uh, uh, fiscal discipline in terms of mobilizing domestic resources and also uh, efficiently allocating the, 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 the expenditures, which were largely about, you know, uh, poverty reductions and uh, COVID actually, you know, uh, 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 brought new insights in terms of actually, as a, a colleague now just said about the urban, you know, uh, food securities and yeah. uh, poverty alleviations. The same thing with the sectoral, you know, components of the domestic economic reforms uh, about the reemphasization. So yeah, that's what I would say. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Namera. Well, um, we'll now turn to Dr. Lulit. Uh, Dr. Lulu, what would have been the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on Ethiopia's export performance and medium-term outlook? Which subsectors are likely to be affected most? Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, how has the, the COVID-19 affected the Ethiopian economy? I think <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's a question that we, we will answer as, as we have more data and more information, but uh, from the different studies that have been conducted and also the ones that the Ethiopian Economic Association has conducted, you know, assuming some prelim preliminary transmission channels, both on the domestic, but also on the international uh, side, uh, uh, it's likely to affect uh, all aspects of the Ethiopian economy. Uh, looking at exports, uh, for instance, if we look at the transmission channels, uh, it could be uh, linked to export demand from the rest of the world, uh, capacity of uh, Ethiopian, uh, uh, the Ethiopian economy to supply, uh, transaction costs, transit, you know, transport, transit, logistics, uh, but also price caps, for instance. So all these elements are in motion. Uh, and overall, uh, I mean, we have seen from some of the, the, the data that has been released that in terms of services, there has been some dramatic effects. Uh, although Ethiopian Airlines, for instance, has been uh, increasing its uh, uh, its its, um, its its services uh, uh, by um, 
uh, by switching more towards uh, transport of commodities and the freight. But if you look at the hotels and restaurants and other you know, the services related to trade, uh, to travel, tourism, those have been definitely affected. Uh, and with the implications on, on, on the, the related jobs. Uh, on the manufacturing sector, also there has been some significant impact, but also some promising, uh, you know, promising uh, opportunities because some fine manufacturing sectors have been able to repurpose their production to address new and emerging issues. Uh, so I think in that sense, uh, it has affected the Ethiopian economy. We don't have the figures yet. We have models that can assume a lot of things, but uh, our assumptions are also evolving. In terms of the medium term uh, outlook, I think uncertainty is, is really the constancy. Uh, I mean, the COVID is spreading here. Uh, we, have, we see also some second waves um, uh, in our trading partners. So uh, that, that's what I would say uh, on, the, on, the, on the COVID and the, its linkages to the exports and the medium term outlook. Thank you, Jenny. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lili, and thanks for keeping your responses concise as well. We'll now turn back to you, Mr. Davu. How have the international donor perspectives and capabilities of the donors changed because of COVID-19? Over to you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Davu. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, basically, the overall perspective do not change. Uh, that means our program remains focused on uh, agricultural development, on agro-industries, uh, on the supporting the SME sectors, on macroeconomic stabilities, and so on. So that do not change. Uh, what has changed is that the, the need to, to, to have quick response to the COVID crisis, and that was a bit difficult. Uh, in that sense, we mobilize, of course, funding that we had from our different contingency funds as part of each project. Uh, we put some specific tailor-made uh, instrument line of credit to, to go to the SMEs, uh, which are very much in, li in line with the economic response of governments to COVID, uh, to, to ensure that SMEs are able to operate in, uh, with the COVID constraint and also to maintain their employment capacities. And thirdly, also we mobilize some, um, uh, we fast track some budget support payment in order to ensure that government has enough uh, forex revenue uh, to, to for the for its balance of payment. So that is something that was considered. Uh, that is on the immediate side, and uh, all those responses are unfolding for the time being. Uh, in the medium term, in our next programming, what we are going to look at, it's uh, better to, uh, to better encapture the risk mechanism. Uh, as much as we have the COVID today, uh, we know that we have the climate change as well, uh, knocking at the door. And we have seen that with dramatic events uh, all over the world in terms of fires, in terms of drought, which uh, ex Ethiopia has uh, the experience of. So that is something that we have to be very much uh, built into a medium term response and uh, to the ability also to react quickly. The notion of contingency funds as part of each of the project to react to, to, to crisis will be into, into place. Uh, of course, the epidemic is not over. Um, so we still have to look at what will be the, I would say, we had the immediate response to the COVID where, uh, we, are, where we had a stop of activities. It seems that today that we, we go with uh, living with the COVID-19 and living with that risk. So also we have to look at the link that we can do between public health and sector policies like agriculture. So for us, it's quite important to look at that. Not only to look at one sector, but to look at the, at a different sector. And of course, as mentioned by the gentleman from uh, the planning commission, is to look at the diversification of uh, what we do. Agriculture sector, indeed, extremely important in terms of proper aspect, but also the link with agro-industrialization and the, the industry and the services, extremely important to, uh, to, to ensure that we have a broad-based economy and not a single-based economy, which is much more resilient to crisis after that. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davu. And now coming to you, Professor Hadnat, 
What are the implications of the COVID-19 crisis for poverty reduction programs and safety nets in Ethiopia? And are new programs needed? Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, if nothing else, COVID-19 reinforced the value of having a safety net program in place before a crisis struck, particularly given the restrictions on movement, trying to set one in, up in the aftermath of such a crisis would have been impossible. Further, we have some preliminary evidence that suggests that households that were beneficiaries of the PSNP experienced smaller reductions in uh, food security than those who did not, uh, did not have access uh, to PSNP benefits. But to say that a program works does not necessarily mean that it always works well, nor does it imply that there's not always room for improvement. So looking to the future, some areas where in fact Ethiopia could continue to strengthen its safety nets are these. One of which is to continue to improve delivery of payments. The existing system has long been clunky. Sometimes it leads to delays in payments, which are problematic. Now is the time to revisit that and see to what extent, in fact, that can be improved. As Dr. Alamayo alluded, PSNP generally works well in the highland areas. It's had a much more mixed record in the lowlands. Admittedly, the lowlands are hard areas to work in, but now might be a time to revisit how, in fact, the PSNP is designed and implemented in Afar, Somali, and parts of Oromia. Third, uh, there is considerable value in seeing how these programs can be expanded into urban areas, given that in the future, we may continue to see crises or shocks which affect urban areas as much as rural areas. And finally, PSNP4, the latest incarnation of PSNP, made some preliminary attempts to make, strengthen links between social protection, health and education. Ethiopia would benefit if these could be strengthened in future programs. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hadnot. And thank you again to all of our panelists for this great discussion. As has already been mentioned, the book has a number of chapters. So I wanna just encourage everyone to explore the full PDF version, which can be found on IFPRI's website. At this moment, uh, we'll now move over to our Q&A portion of the program. And as before, I encourage those of you who wish to submit brief questions and comments to do so, typing them into the chat box on ifpri.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using hashtag AskIFPRI on Twitter. And feel free to share your name and institution as well as the person to whom you're directing your question. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in and I'm gonna take one at a time and may consolidate them as needed. Uh, so I ask the speakers to please be brief in their responses again so we can accommodate as many questions as, as possible. The first question I'll, draw, I'll direct to, uh, to Bart and it's from Pamela Anderson from a USAID BIFAD member. And she's asking, what is driving the price increases for the nutrient dense foods? Over to you, Bart. Uh, thank you for that uh, very important question. And we actually have started looking uh, at, at that question. Yeah, so one thing has been that, you know, the government has really focused on cereal crops in the last uh, 10, 15 years, have had an amazing uh, achievement there. But so relatively less attention has been given to these uh, other sectors, to the fruit and vegetables, to the livestock sector. They have been a little bit neglected. And so the demand changes have been much faster than the supply changes, okay? Because there have been not as many new technologies that have come into place. And so uh, that has been partly the biggest reason for that, for that increase. But we actually have a, a paper on that, so you can find that on our uh, page. Great, thank you, Bart. This next, next question is for, is for Paul. It's from Feru, and, uh, or it could also be for Dr. Minton or whoever wants to jump in, of course. Um, the question is, is there any reliable information on how much pasture has expanded over uh, t the last 10 to 20 years? Uh, well, thank you for that yeah. question. Uh, the the uh, satellite data uh, shows, uh, uh, some, uh, well, let me just say the satellite data is a bit ambiguous in terms of uh, how much pasture land has expanded. What, what's somewhat clear is in some places, the amount of tree cover uh, has declined. Uh, and in fact, uh, some pasture land, as I, I'm 
I imagine the questioner knows also has been uh, planted to uh, food crops and other crops as well. Uh, but uh, the satellite data up to this point uh, can't really give a conclusive answer to that. Bart, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, I would maybe like to add the following. We, we had uh, a little study that we have done on the dairy sector in, in Ethiopia and saw what we saw happening there. There was a lot of conversion of that pasture land to cropland, actually. And so especially these people in, in more remote villages, they were running out of pasture land. There is obviously an issue. And so especially the, the, the commonly used pasture land. And so you see more a shift to private grazing land and, and that kind of transformation happening, but it, it, there is clearly a shortage in this better connected areas, at least. Great. Um, I'll, I'll try directing this next question to Dr. Namera. It's from Dr. Kasahun uh, Suleiman. And the question is, how is the private sector and other stakeholders, how are they viewing risks associated with Ethiopia's agri-food system? And where are the opportunities post COVID-19? Uh, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so I mean, one of the priority or uh, shift in direction that uh, homegrown economic reform has identified is, of course, even compared to the peers, you know, in uh, Africa, Ethiopia has one of the lowest uh, growth and development of the private sector in general in uh, overall economic uh, sector. And when it comes to the agricultural sector, it's uh, really you know, uh, very disappointing. And uh, one of the priorities within the agricultural sector and also in the broader you know, participation of the private sector is uh, in order to increase their uh, uh, participations uh, in, the, you know, uh, in the investment. Of course, uh, from the private sector's point of view, the risks are uh, multifaceted. Uh, you no, know, some elements of it comes with the you know the, the, the you know the broader you know business and uh, climate uh, investment is not really conducive enough uh, to the you know the private sectors, and uh, that itself you know entails uh, risk and uh, the uncertainty that uh, it would you know uh, in, in, entails, and the other is also the type of uh, growth strategy that Ethiopia has followed uh, entailed. A preferential treatment for the public sectors, uh, whether it is uh, in uh, you know uh, initiatives in the agriculture sector or broader you know uh, economic uh, activities, so that needs to be really you know uh, uh, changed. And uh, even actually, one of uh, the priorities that have happened in the homegrown economic reform is uh, to identify all the major bottlenecks uh, 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 in that respect. And uh, one of the areas is uh, access to finance. Uh, Ethiopian commercial you know, banks are enclave. They only uh, loan out to the urban economy, not uh, rural economies. And the private sectors, uh, whether it is the smallest, small scale cooperatives or large scale you know, private sectors, uh, their, their access to credit uh, compared to the public you know, uh, initiatives of public sector is uh, uh, very high. You know, it's, a, it's one of the daunting challenges that Ethiopian economy faced, and now the government has uh, given priority to it. And uh, even at uh, yeah, the last two years, the credits you know provided to the private sector, of course, it's coming from the low base, but the growth that it showed is uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a big you know, growth. And in terms of the volume that the credit that you know the loanable fund that uh, given to the agricultural sector is also you know increasing over the last two years. So these are you know the the ways in which. The risk is uh, associated with the private sector participation in the agriculture and the overall economic uh, sectors would be addressed. And also then the administratively in terms of modernizing taxation system, any other bureaucracies that uh, you know, uh, uh, are seen as a bottleneck for the private sector in initiative, whether it is the you know, uh, SMEs or uh, large scale is being prioritized and uh, the doing business initiative is also doing a great job in that uh, perspective. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, we're, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to take a, a few more questions um, and combine it, two questions actually for Dr. Alamayu uh, next. These are both related to the PSNP. The first is from Mekdes Girma from Digital Green in Ethiopia, and she asks, what are the major impacts of PSNP in women? Some are targeted as beneficiaries phase after phase and with less willingness to graduate. 
she's wondering what your reflection is. And, and the second question, may, perhaps related in, in regards to the PSMP, is from Judith Appleton. And she says she's astonished to hear that there's been no impact on child nutrition. Uh, by contrast, the UN Sun reports hail Ethiopia as a startling example of improvements in stunting among under fives over the recent years. So she's wondering why there's such a disparity of, of interpretation or if the data are faulty. Passing the floor to you, LMIU. And go ahead and please unmute yourself, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jenny. Thank you very much for uh, uh, the questions. In terms of uh, uh, the first one, uh, recent, uh, uh, recent uh, uh, PSNP uh, for uh, the recent phase of the PSNP, particularly focuses on one uh, important dimension for women, and that is the treatment of uh, pregnant and lactating uh, women. A new status called the Temporary Direct Support Program has uh, a status has been created for them, and uh, they would uh, count as per, uh, uh, as uh, uh, part of the public works, but would not be required to to uh, do the labor requirement and re receive uh, uh, benefits uh, until uh, the the child uh, reaches a, a certain age, a year and a half or or, or so, and also uh, uh, families with uh, particularly malnourished children were given uh, the same the same uh, uh, status and uh, uh, provide support. That is a major uh, innovation. The, the relationship with graduation is a bit a bit uh, uh, tricky. In terms of uh, the second question, uh, the child nutrition one, I have to be very precise. It uh, is the result states or the result is that PSNP itself, or PSNP transfers themselves did not lead to a significant improvement in child nutrition. Of course, there were large public investments, health, uh, education, uh, sanitation, and so on. All these uh, investments and the broader growth in income, of course, uh, in the economy led to improvements in uh, child anthropometric results like stunting, uh, re re reduced stunting and, and, uh, and so on. So the, 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 this, this particular result is specific to the contribution PSNP transfers made to uh, child nutrition. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alamayu. This uh, question is for Bart. Uh, it's from Jeffrey Reed from Luma Consulting in Seattle, US. He asks, have new policies or better implemented policies over the last decade contributed to the advance of net exports? And which policies are the most important? Where do you, Bart? Yeah, there have been clearly, there has been clearly a focus of the government to increase exports. So the big example is obviously the, the flower exports and the horticulture exports that have really taken off in a, in a, in a big way in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, so I think they are now the, the second bigger, biggest exporter of flowers in the in the, in Africa, and so yeah, the, the the policy of the government obviously played a big role in that. So with its tax exemption and, and giving special credit to to people that invested in these areas, and again now with these agro industrial parks that are being set up with special uh, tax incentives, obviously that should have an effect on on that. But, but yeah, there has been a big impact of that. Okay, great. Um, uh, I think um, a, num a number of you talked about shocks, but I thought maybe I would um, direct this question to Mr. Davu and also potentially to uh, Dr. Lulit. The question's from Dr. Leila as well, a climate scientist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He asks, which shocks are most detrimental to agricultural production? The 2015 drought, for example, was brought about by rains that were both late and less intense than normal. Is there a tangible benefit if farmers can anticipate these shocks? Over to you, Mr. Davu. Obviously, yes, because we expect shock. Uh, you know, there has been a World Bank studies uh, done sometime in 2015 uh, to show that uh, arid and semi-arid land in Africa will uh, experience uh, the more frequency in terms of shock and basically uh, overall a more drier, uh, more drier weather uh, as such. Uh, so indeed, yes, we have to inbuild that in our program, uh, and we have to not only inbuild that in our program, we have to 
as part of our dialogue with the government to make sure that that is inbuilt as part of the of the planning uh, in the different sector. Uh, that's the reason we have had uh, under the IGAD initiative what we call the ending drought emergency uh, policy, and where basically the the risk should be inbuilt uh, should be inbuilt as part of each sector policies which are delivery on the field. We speak of the health policy, we speak of the agriculture policy, the water policies, and of course, the, the synergy between these different policies. Um, yeah, so that, that, is, uh, that, that has to be integrated as part of our response uh, and as part of our program. Over to you. Great. Um, Unfortunately, we're, we're drawing really close on time and we've received a lot of questions and comments online and we really appreciate those. I'll share them with the speakers, but um, in the interest of time, I'd like to give the speakers the chance to just give the audience um, quick final takeaway messages. In 30 seconds or less, um, I'd like to go in the following order, asking for your final takeaways. Um, for first, Professor Hadanat, followed by Mr. Davu, then Dr. Lulit, Dr. Namera, Bart, Alamayu, and then Paul. So over to you, Professor Hadanat. Uh, Jenny, uh, Ethiopians should be enormously proud of the significant progress they've made in reducing food insecurity, reducing hunger, increasing agricultural productivity, and reducing poverty. Looking to the future, there are many good ideas, many of which have been discussed in this conversation about how those, that can be uh, maintained and accelerated. But those good ideas will have to work within an environment where there will be new and these stronger challenges, shocks from environmental considerations, political considerations, health considerations. And future success in these areas is going to depend on whether Ethiopians can rise to the occasion and address these shocks. Thank you. Thank you, over to Mr. Davo. Yes, I would say that uh, indeed the coherence between the policies, the different policies and the different investment, public investment, private investment that, is, that are going to be made are essential. Uh, because of the risk, we cannot look today at an agri policy alone without the industrialization policy without basically the water resource management policy, without the land resource management policies. And also we have to factor in the demographic uh, aspect in terms of job, uh, which we need to create jobs. So the link between the demography and the job creation is es essential. But anyway, uh, Ethiopia has proved to be very resourceful and has moved quite a lot in a disciplined way. Uh, in a context of decentralization. So we really look forward that uh, uh, building those synergy in a constructive manner uh, will yield uh, success for Ethiopia. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Lully. Yes, uh, I think our country has 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 many opportunities uh, to grow. And uh, one of the dimensions that were not mentioned today are women. And I think, you know, instead of considering these gender dimensions as, you know, cross sector dimensions, if we also can think of policies that uh, give more opportunities to women to grow as mothers, as caregivers, but also as employees, as, as entrepreneurs, uh, we would uh, we would gain a lot as a country as a nation. Thank you, Dr. Lili. Dr. Namera. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, and uh, it was really a privilege uh, taking part on this panel, as I said earlier. Yes, uh, Ethiopia has achieved you know uh, an incredible growth stories over the past two three decades, and uh, there is still you know a daunting challenges. Uh, ahead of us uh, in all sectors of uh, the economy. And uh, there is this uh, big will willingness uh, domestically to undertake uh, broad-based and very bold uh, you know, uh, policy reforms and uh, diversifying the source of uh, economic growth. And uh, the 10 years you know, uh, perspective development plan also you know, uh, comes at the back of uh, that you know, reform processes. And uh, I do really hope that uh, Ethiopia will uh, 
you know, uh, tap into the natural resource potentials uh, that she has and uh, alleviate, uh, you know, poverty in its all uh, forms, you know, uh, in years to come. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Bart. Yeah, Ethiopia had an excellent performance uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, this was partly a catch up growth. This was also uh, largely public sector driven. So there will be different challenges in the future. Uh, they will need, Ethiopia will need a more diversified agricultural economy with more attention to uh, animal source food and, and food and vegetables, etc. cetera. Uh, and to do that, the, the government will have to uh, see a shift uh, towards a bigger role of the private sector in that because these sectors are much more complicated to manage than, than the cereal sector. Thanks. Thank you, Bart. Over to you, Alamayu. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I agree with uh, what has been said before, uh, but I'll stick to uh, the PSNP. Uh, Ethiopia has to uh, build on the success uh, of the PSNP. And particularly, it is important, in my view, to work much uh, harder and in depth uh, uh, in terms of designing and redesigning the PSNP to improve its contributions to asset accumulation and livelihood uh, diversification. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Paul. Even with structural uh, change related to increased incomes, urbanization, and improved infrastructure, Agricultural investments and, and investments in the broader agri-food systems remain strongly pro-poor. And so continued investments in these sectors, uh, for example, through agricultural research and extension, rural and secondary city transport and infrastructure and electricity supply, these are still crucial for improving equity and reducing poverty in Ethiopia. Great, thank you very much. I'm a Sikanalo. Thank you very much, Paul. And thank you to everyone who's joining us online to launch our book on Ethiopia's agri-food system. A big thank you to all of the authors, and there are many of them, only a few of them are presenting here. All the authors have made very important contributions, and I strongly encourage you to read and explore the book and read its synopsis. Thank you again to each of our speakers and panelists and to our audience for joining this discussion. Please continue the conversation on our social media platforms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.